every day is Women's History Month. My mama taught me that without even saying it. Hi, everybody. This is Chatbox. I'm David Cruz. It is Women's History Month, and we are marking the achievement of women today, in this case, shaping New Jersey's political landscape. Joining us today are power players in their circles and beyond. Bonnie Watson Coleman represents the 12th Congressional District in Congress. She's the first black woman to represent New Jersey in Congress. Holly Schapese is a Republican state senator representing District 39 in Bergen and Passaic counties. She is the Senate Republican deputy conference leader. And Senator Teresa Ruiz is a Democratic state senator representing the 29th district in Essex. She is also the Senate majority leader. Good to see you all. Welcome back to Chatbox. You're all veterans of elected office. I wonder how much you stop to think today how the role of women has changed in, politi in politics since you started out. Congresswoman, let's start with you. Is there something you remember from your earliest days that has changed over the years? Yeah, the fact that there are so many more women in uh, elective office and in leadership. I mean, I'm here with two leaders in uh, the New Jersey legislature right now. And when I was there, there was, you know, maybe two. Now there are many more because you've got uh, committee uh, heads as well. Um, but even in Congress, there are so many more women in Congress. And I think that uh, if anything, uh, we owe this to organizations and, and institutions like women's um, uh, American Women's Political Adventures with Debbie Walsh, et cetera, intentional organizations to bring us to the table and to show us that we can and we should serve in these respective uh, positions. So, yeah, there's just a lot more of us, and that's a good thing for this country and for this state. Senator Schapese, what, what have you uh, seen over your career as an elected official that has changed in New Jersey as it pertains to women in politics? I uh, actually, even for myself, up until I became senator a year ago, it's amazing to say in 2021, 2022, at the time I came in, I doubled the number of female Republicans in the Senate. And I'm the very first uh, woman to ever be a senator in the district that I'm representing. Um, we have made tremendous strides in seeing additional women get involved, but we still have a lot of work to do and in increasing numbers. And there's so many bright, talented women who kind of stayed out because they couldn't figure out how to juggle the balance between work life, having children, being involved in politics, and some of the barriers to entry. Um, many of our county committees, many of our political leadership had historically been men. And uh, so I think a lot of women were intimidated to even get involved. And we're slowly starting to see that go to the wayside as women such as myself, um, Congresswoman uh, Watson Coleman and Senator Ruiz, starting to get into the leadership roles and be mentors for other women who want to get involved and may have felt an apprehension in doing so. Senator Ruiz, you're a mom. In fact, all of you are, are moms. Um, has the traditional role of women as homemaker and as keeper of the home, has that impacted? Uh, I mean, obviously it's impacted over the years, but do you see it changing at all? So that's, that's an interesting uh, question to ask me because I, the reason why I always say that I'm a feminist as strong mm -hmm. as I am is, was because of my dad, right? A Puerto Rican man who would come home and would cook, uh, clean, vacuum, whatever it took, because he was the first person to enter the household. And so I saw him already breaking down those gender roles at an early age in life. And so for me, it was very different that those predispositions of what was expected as a homemaker or the caretaker to be primarily set as women um, were far removed early on. Although, as you know, he didn't want anybody outside of the house to know exactly what he was doing it, but he was setting a huge example for my sister and I. Look, I think we've done a lot of things in our spaces, particularly a bill that, that uh, I know uh, Senator Shapizi at the time may have still been in the assembly and, and 
we signed into office, and that was the ability to use campaign funds to run for office specifically for child care purposes, which is something that, you know, if you don't have a network of support systems or you're not resourced, could be an obstacle and even attempting to say, am I going to run for office? Congresswoman, the House has a world famous uh, female speaker in Nancy Pelosi, and, and women have made strides in Congress, as you said. But right now, around a quarter of Congress is female. But as you know, women are 50% of the population. Are we ever going to see a Congress that is 50% women? If we, um, if we continue to work hard and to organize and to educate, I think that. Um, Women are, are vitally important to any elected office, to any institution. I think that uh, the kind of schism between the parties, though, has sort of blurred our um, desire and need to be involved uh, and, and the original reasons for our being involved, because we were less concerned with party labels and things of that nature, more concerned with issues. Um, but as we see the, the partisanship uh, escalate, particularly in Congress, hopefully not so much in our state legislature, you all still get a lot of things done together. Um, I, I think that we, we do a disservice by saying, you know, well, I want to be there because I'm a woman and the issues of uh, body autonomy and things of that nature uh, are, are what are important. And I'm going to stand up for those issues. But I remember when um, Teresa was pregnant. So we all had to help her <laughs> in just making sure that she was okay and feeling well enough to be there in place during voting sessions. And, and, and what I can add to that, David, is that the sad thing is that I'm the only woman in the history of the state Senate to have given birth while in elected office, which speaks to how few of us have been in those spaces and what age demographic we're coming into that space. Um, maybe after we've raised a family deciding to run for office, it's, it's quite different in the assembly because a lot of women have raised that assembly floor while while bringing life into space, but in the Senate, I you know I I I've been the lone standing individual to do that. Senators, the number in New Jersey is around thirty eight percent women in the legislature. Same question to both of you. Let's start with you, Senator Shapizi. I, uh, you know, and uh, going to Senator Ruiz's comment, uh, when I got sworn into the assembly. I actually was carrying my five-month-old son. I, I ran two weeks after I had given birth. And it was a wild experience. And I think a lot has changed. He's now 10. But I recall you know, some of the very same people who said, I can't believe a mother with a brand new baby would run for office. And you know, we get a lot of that sort of negative feedback. And meanwhile, the very same people who would be like, oh, how is she going to do this with balancing a family would then look at me and go, I can't believe she's bringing her child to these events. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's been quite a decade in uh, you know, raising children and having them participate in the process with me. Um, as to women in the legislature, uh, we saw in the past election for New Jersey, a lot of Republican women came into the assembly. And it was really nice to see where I think that the women have different sensibilities uh, in the work-life balance and do have the capacity. Yes, women's issues are very important, but I think the financial issues impacting on women as they are a co-equal branch in their households have become even a more pressing thing. And I think that uh, we can all work together in a bipartisan fashion to try to put forth a more friendly economic environment for families in New Jersey. And I think right now that's a number one priority. And it's what is actually having women get involved who may have not been involved beforehand. You know, we are in an era where it looks as if the abortion rights afforded by Roe v. Wade uh, are likely to be taken away. What impact do you think that's going to have nationally and what role are you prepared to take to ensure 
that those rights continue if, if you think they should. Let's start with, uh, with you, Congresswoman. Well, I think, um, you know, my position on this issue has been quite clear and quite consistent uh, that this is not something that government should be involved in. Women ought to have agency over themselves. They ought to have autonomy over themselves. And I believe there was a time when we had sort of more um, uh, compatibility with women, irrespective of what their uh, party alignments were around this issue. Unfortunately, I think that uh, this, um, this, this agency over themselves is definitely in jeopardy with this Supreme Court as it stands right now, and that Congress has a responsibility to codify as much as it can, Roe v. Wade. Now, we did that in the House of Representatives. We need to do that in the Senate. And in order to do that in the Senate, we need the Senate to recognize that it needs to um, ad adapt to more um, updated standards and, and rules to play by. Let's hear from the Republican uh, on our panel. New Jersey, of course, has codified abortion rights into the Constitution here. Um, but Senator uh, Shapizi, your party, um, you're the exception as opposed to the rule there. You are also um, pro-choice, for lack of a better description, yeah? I, I am. I, How do you I bring your party along? I don't believe Roe v. Wade should be overturned. I think that if some of the limitations in Texas and other states um, is going to disproportionately negatively impact um, women who may be in lower socioeconomic, um, who don't have access, don't have the ability. If you're wealthy and live in Texas, you're going to figure out a way to be able to get, you know, whatever procedure it is that you may need for you, yourself, your child. And I think that it's unfortunate, um, that you know some of these extreme measures are being passed because I I do think it will have a negative outcome on those who don't who aren't able to afford other options. Um, so it's a it's a difficult conversation. A lot of people who are Republican are extraordinarily pro life um, to an extent where. You know, I struggled with fertility. Um, my son was in vitro under some of these laws. You know, my son, who's a miracle, would not necessarily be here. So, you know, I come from it from a much different perspective than some of my colleagues do. So equal pay for women. Um, equal pay day was uh, just this week. Senator Ruiz, women make 83 cents on the dollar uh, in general versus men. And for Latinas, as you pointed out in a tweet this week, they make 55 cents on that same dollar. How do you fix that in 30 seconds? So, I mean, fixing it is just destigmatizing a lot of it. I think people, when they hear that number, they automatically think that it's that, that these women are going into low paid wage uh, sector groups. The truth of the matter is that there have been studies put out there that a Latina nurse versus their white male counterpart, and probably the same for that woman in that space, is still making less on the dollar. I think, you know, at the topic itself in it of today is just taking away the, the the preconceived notion of who we are based on our gender and not understanding that we're human beings capable, powerful, uh, superior oftentimes in certain circumstances. You asked the question before, I didn't get to chime in, I'm gonna chime in now. We need more women in, in, in elected spaces. We need a woman in every single space where a decision is being made, not because we're perfect, but because we lend ourselves in a different way in a different capacity. So five women in a room and give us a great obstacle to overcome. None of us are going to agree on the bottom line. We're going to curse. We're going to scream. We're going to cry. And we're going to laugh. But when the door opens, you will not know what has happened in that room, except for the fact that we move the needle and we move the line in the sand. And that is true power. I also think that there is an issue of not only gender discrimination, but genderizing the jobs that we typically find ourselves in and therefore devaluing them um, as it relates to uh, society. Now, we talk about you know, some of the frontline um, workers 
who were very essential, particularly during the pandemic. But you even think about nurses and you think about teachers um, and you wonder, and, and, and you know, folks in administrative positions, those positions tend to pay less um, than their sort of counterparts at a different level. And we find, we typically find women in those levels. We need to reimagine the impact and the value of some of those care industry jobs to our communities, keeping our communities safe and healthy, as well as other types of um, uh, a work that women typically find themselves uh, overly represented. And I know you're trying to wrap us up, but in that same space is exposing individuals who are not usually uh, represented in high growth industries, whether it's finances in the STEM fields and making sure that we have apprenticeship programs that really takes a seventh and eighth grader, a high school and a college person and says, you know, you could work in this kind of space. How do we connect you through the higher ed or through a certificate program? And then how do you become a six figure employee uh, paying taxes in New Jersey? All right, we may have come a long way, baby, but we still got a ways to go. Teresa yeah. Ruiz, Bonnie Watson, Coleman, Holly Shapizi, great to see you all. Thanks for coming on with us today. Great Thanks to for having you. us. It's good to see my former Thank colleagues. You. Thank you. Nice to see you. I miss you. <laughs> Any mom or dad will tell you that raising kids is the hardest job anyone can ever have. They will also probably tell you that the past two years have been the hardest yet. Families affected by COVID, and everything else that's happening today are seeing their children stressing out and worse. That was the topic of discussion at a recent Senate Education Committee. With us are the chairman of that committee, Senator Vin Gopal, and Amy Kennedy, the education director at the Kennedy Forum, who presented testimony at that hearing. Welcome to you both. Senator, tell us about the hearing and, and what is it was about it uh, and, and about this issue that is close to you particularly. Thank you, David. Um, I, you know, this was a really important hearing and we, uh, you know, Amy Kennedy is a, a rock star and the Kennedy Foundation has been doing an incredible work on this uh, across the country. But we had stakeholders with cabinet members and uh, different leaders of the nonprofit sector talk about how important mental health in our schools is right now. As we get to the other end of COVID, um, we're seeing that uh, it, it had an incredible impact, not just on a child who might have lost a, a graduation or a prom, but just everything from as basic as that to more expansive on the challenges they had in their household. So that's what this hearing looked at. Uh, it's a personal issue for me. I've had mental health struggles. Uh, uh, you know, I've been very open about it. And I think it's important in breaking the stigma that we have those, those conversations. I think we did that in this hearing. Amy Kennedy, you were there and you also gave uh, some personal testimony. Can you, you talk a little bit about, uh, about that and, and the real crisis in mental health services in school, really a national emergency. That's right, David, thank you. And thank you, Senator Gopal, for sharing your lived experience. I think that's what this all is about right now. So many people are talking about the challenges that they're having, and yet we haven't put in place all of the structures to help meet the demands. So it's fantastic that we see a reduction in stigma, but we need to make sure that we're supporting kids where they're spending most of their time. And at the moment when they first start to show those signs, I shared at that testimony how I've lost many of my own students and how I have five children of my own. So just like the parents you are describing, you know, we have those own struggles in our household and we need to make sure that when kids show those signs that the staff in the building know where to turn for resources and that they're in place and they can be seamless from when they first get identified to that care that treats the whole family. Can we talk a little bit about how we see these issues manifest themselves? How, how are kids acting out because of all the stress that they're under? I can give you one example. You know, this was very telling. It was a, it was a young, young uh, girl uh, in her class last year during COVID, and she started crying because she was hungry. Uh, and usually the, 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 the teachers would have caught that if it was in person because of the free and reduced lunch program. But now she wasn't even getting one proper meal. Um, just the lack of not having kids in the classroom. Uh, some of our amazing teachers and educators weren't able to catch uh, catch a lot of it. So I think this is, we're going to have a lot of challenges, some small, some big on the mental health. And 
you know, we're, we're looking at students here, but this obviously had a big impact on, on parents and teachers and everyone in between. So making sure that our schools have the resources uh, and access to social workers, therapists, counselors, uh, and making sure that every student has the social and emotional uh, well-being to succeed uh, outside the classroom is going to be crucial for inside of the classroom. And, and what's the inside impact, Amy Kennedy, inside the classroom? You know, a lot of times it demonstrates itself in challenging behaviors in the classroom. So we are seeing not only an increase in depression and anxiety in school avoidant behavior, but even fights in the school building. And we know that teacher burnout is at an all time high. And that's, you know, no question also connected to this issue. So feeling like they're unable to help the students in their classroom and being able to recognize that sometimes when we see a challenging behavior, that there may be lying issues that are presenting themselves in these symptoms. So, uh, you know, identification is key and how we can intervene before it becomes a you know, a referral for juvenile justice rather than a health condition. That's important. Yeah, and it's K to 12, of course. Um, you talked about uh, guidance counselors. Uh, I mean, you talked about uh, teacher shortages, but it brought to mind, uh, to me, guidance counselors who, you know, when I was a kid and we were in school, if, if there were issues, the guidance counselor interceded. Do, do people even go out to be guidance counselors anymore? And and is there difficulty recruiting people for those roles? There's a really uh, short staff in guidance counselors and in all mental health professionals. So if students are having difficulty in school, you hope that they're seeing the guidance counselor, but also know that the guidance counselors have been tasked with administering standardized tests, with career planning, with a multitude of other things. And so that's not going to be your one stop for all mental health needs in a school building, especially because the ratio of students to guidance counselor is so understaffed. And so we need to make sure that there's going to be a pipeline of professionals to fill those fields and then also fill in with community providers. It is uh, budget time, as I'm sure you know, um, Senator. Uh, what can the state do in terms of more funding or, or legislation or policy? Yeah, this is a really unique time because the state is fortunate to have so much in federal funds um, uh, and ARP funds. So, you know, we're calling on the governor uh, and the legislative leadership to, to work together. And, and you know, I've, I've been pushing and they've been great. Last year in the budget, we added uh, an additional $11 million uh, that I was proud to sponsor. Uh, for our early intervention programs, our EISS programs across the state. We also added $5 million in the budget for our school link service programs, which are mental health programs that we're hoping to expand throughout school districts across the, uh, uh, across the state. So I'm hopeful this year we're going to make a really big investment uh, in mental health in our school districts. And I think that this is, this is the time to do it because of the federal resources that we're fortunate to have. Where can parents go uh, for help? If you are concerned about your child and you're just not sure, you can go online to MHA's website and take a free screening. They have screenings. A half a million people a month are taking screenings on MHA's website. There are some resources there. NAMI, your local chapters of both MHA and NAMI would be a great place to start, as well as making sure that you're calling and connecting um, with your community providers. So check in with your pediatrician because they are really familiar with these issues and are hearing about it all the time. Don't be afraid to contact the school social worker if they're available and let them know at school what you're seeing at home and your concerns. Everyone should be talking to each other. Senator, reaching kids is an important part of this too because these are new feelings for kids you know, who are having to deal with everything that's going on in the world and seeing it nonstop all day long, they need to understand that it's okay to feel like you don't have control of everything. Yeah, they have to. And look, I can't imagine as a kid having to be told, this is when you wear a mask, this is when you don't wear a mask. All these things have an impact. And especially a, a child, if it was different than their sibling, it's going to have an impact. So um, yeah, this is this is a troubling time. And, um, you know, you've got some kids that are uh, very COVID COVID conscious, which is good. But, you know, we want to make sure it doesn't impact uh, anyone's mental health. And unfortunately, that's what's happening too often. 
Yeah. Well, kids feel everything, even when we think they're okay. Vin Gopal, Amy Kennedy, I appreciate you coming on with us to talk about this. Good to see you both. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That's chat box for this week. Thanks to Bonnie Watson Coleman, Holly Shapizi, and Teresa Ruiz. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz and Jay, and be sure to subscribe to the YouTube page for more stuff like Business Beat with Rhonda and NJ Spotlight News with Brianna. I'm David Cruz. For all the team over here, thanks for watching. Have a great week. Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight online at insidernj.com.